COVID-19 has heard of the coronavirus? Anyone? Ms. Ms. Mora has heard of it. Sister Ernestine, you heard of it? Okay. So yearly, we have four known human coronaviruses. And there are two alpha strains of it, as well as two beta strains of it. Children, as well as adults, every fall and winter will get the colds. We inevitably, it's seasonal. So every year, everybody gets sniffles and colds. Rarely do we ever die from these. And that's simply because it's been in existence for a long time. And we, as humans, are the carriers of this particular corona human strain. So we don't ever die from this. However, most recently, there have been two other beta coronavirus strains that we have come to know other than COVID-19. The first one was SARS. SARS hit in 2003, and we, it, SARS is essentially a short name for uh, Severe Acute Respiratory uh, Distress Syndrome. And if you look at the medical terminology, it's listed as SARS-CoV, short for SARS coronavirus. I'm gonna point out the reason for that in a minute here. The second was MERS, which is short for Middle Eastern Respiratory Distress Syndrome. That was noted in 2012. That also is a beta coronavirus. And now we have SARS-CoV. I'm pointing out the obvious difference here between SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2. And I'll get to the reasons why we named it that. But we don't call that SARS-CoV, we now just call that short for COVID-19. And this came about in 2019. So how did we first discover COVID-19? Back in December of 2019, the world first learned of a very atypical cluster of infection known as pneumonia in Wuhan, China. And at the time, reports were they perhaps thought the reason for this was the transmission of in infectious diseases from people possibly been exposed to animals at the Wuhan Seafood International Market, which is really known for its exotic diseases and animals. In particular, they do sell some bats there. So the theory was that perhaps this was transmitted somewhere in the seafood market due to the fact that they have these exotic animals and in particular bats, because bats are the carriers of the coronavirus. Um, however, recently there has been a lot of controversy uh, in the medical profession as well as uh, in scientists. And what they in particular noted that the strain of COVID-19 as well as SARS are 87% genetically similar. There is a theory perhaps that this virus may not have come from the seafood market after all, and perhaps it would have been genetically engineered. I will emphasize to you all that there is no medical evidence that this particular virus came from the lab. I will also say there is currently no medical evidence that this virus came from the seafood market either. To this day, despite having known about this virus since December of 2019, we do not have an intermediary host. And I'll get to that in a minute. So to this day, we do not know how this virus came to be. And the reason for that is because China has not allowed any of the international investigators or scientists to come into the country to actually study the original case. The index case is what we call the first person that is infected. And to this day, we do not know who that person is, and we do not have any medical information as to how this person came to get infected. And that is the reason why the world to this day remains unknown and unclear how this virus came to be. So let's talk about the three types of beta coronaviruses that I just briefly discussed to you. What are the similarities and what are the differences? And you'll see some of the similarities be quite astounding. So SARS, MERS, as well as COVID-19 are all beta coronaviruses. They all originated from the bat. The SARS came from the intermediate hairy host of a seabed cat. That's how it got transmitted to the human. Whereas the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, came from the bat, followed by transmission to the camel, which then infected a human. COVID-19, as I alluded to earlier, we do not have an intermediary host. So we do not know uh, how this came to be. The incubation period for both SARS and MERS is roughly five days. The incubation period is essentially the period from the time you are infected to the time that you actually develop symptoms. 
if you look at COVID-19, the incubation period is longer. And to some extent, scientists are even saying maybe even as long as 14 days. But the average incubation period for COVID-19 is about 7.6 days. Also look at the r naught, which is the R0 that I listed there. Both SARS and NIRS are quite similar. It's at 2.2, whereas COVID is higher at 3 to 3.5. Three so you'll ask me, what exactly is the r naught? The r naught is a terminology that scientists as well as infectious disease and epidemiologists use to describe an infection and, and how easily transmittable it is. So for example, the regular seasonal flu has an r naught between a 0 0.9 to a 2.5. What that essentially means is for every one person that has the flu, that person can then go out to infect two and a half other people, roughly. For COVID-19, for every one person that gets infected, they can go and infect three other people. This compared to the measles, which to this day remains the most infectious disease of all, with the r not between 12 to 15. That is quite astounding. For every one person that the measles infects, it will then turn around and infect 12 to other 15 other people. So you compare that to COVID-19, definitely COVID-19 is much more infectious than its predecessors, either SARS and MERS, but not as infectious as your measles. So that's a baseline for you to understand what exactly those numbers mean. Looking also at the infectivity as well as the risk factors for death, all three are the same. The highest risk factors remain old age and comorbid medical conditions. But you can also see COVID-19 has now infected close to 5.4 million people now worldwide compared to SARS and NIRS. SARS has been eradicated um, very early because we detected it very early. Eight months after we found it, it, we contained it and it's no longer here. MERS has not been eradicated at, that I am aware of. However, it has been contained and I have not had any reports in the literature about that in the United States. Uh, mostly it's first came in the Middle East and it remains in the Middle East. Are you all still following me there? Yes. <coughs> so, how is this transmitted? <coughs> the most common way to get transmission remains face-to-face -face through droplet as well as aerosol. And I'll explain the difference between the two. But droplet is basically what I just did, cough. Um, talking, um, sneezing, singing, because when you talk, spits come out and those will inform in, in terms of droplet. So in order for you to get COVID, you have to be exposed to someone for a prolonged period of time. So you're going to ask me, what does that mean? Exactly what does prolonged mean? There has been no evidence to say that if you're exposed to someone for 10 minutes, you're going to get it, or 45 minutes. All I can tell you is in literature, if you read all the medical literature, it will say if you've been exposed to someone for anywhere from 10 to 45 minutes, which is a definition of prolonged, and that person is infected, your risk of getting an infection is extremely high. If you have a brief exposure to someone who has COVID, your chance is less. However, it still remains higher than if you had ex brief exposure to someone who is an asymptomatic carrier with no symptom. And you will ask me why, which I will get to in the next few minutes. That has a, a lot to do with viral shedding. It's a phenomenon that happens and I'll explain in detail when we get to that uh, part of our presentation. So how do we also get it? The other way that we get it is aerosol, which we all think in the medical community now is the number one reason for transmission. What has been shown in the laboratory setting is that the air, the air that which COVID travels can actually be suspended in the air for quite a significant amount of time. In the laboratory setting, it's actually been suspended in the air for about three hours. Wow. Um, that, however, is not real life condition. That is not outside um, and it's mainly mostly a laboratory setting. That's why I, I said that. But we think that the primary reason for transmission is uh, aerosol. Maternal transmission is another way. 
So if a mother gets infected, usually most of the time third trimester, she can pass that on to her infant. However, in all studies that I've seen published out of China originally as well as in Italy um, and some of the other countries, the infants usually did very well. They did not have infection or if they did, they were very low and most of the infants actually survived. Both mom and babies usually did well. The last one is this contact surface spread, which is quite interesting. And I'll get to this slide here. It's a very busy slide. But this particular study came out of the New England Journal of Medicine, which is a, a renowned um, journal that we all read on a daily basis here. This came out in early April. And what this study did was researchers, one, was able to compare SARS against COVID and see how they were different. And if you look, they're not at all very different. And, and remember, 87% of the genetic makeup is very similar. So it's not a surprise that these two behave very similarly. So if you look in the red is the SARS-CoV-2. And here on the aerosol, it hangs around for about three hours. That's column A on your left upper right there, where it says titers of viable virus. If you also look, it remains on copper for about four hours. And on cardboard, it's about 24 hours that you'll still see some resemblance of a virus. On stainless steel, it can last anywhere from 48 to 72 hours, as well as plastic. So what is the significance of this study? Does it mean anything? We don't know. And the reason why we don't know is because in order for you to actually get an infection from touching a contact surface that has COVID-19, you have to know a lot of things. Number one, you would have to know exactly how much virus there is. What exactly is the inoculum rate? If the longer the virus has been sitting out on the surface, the less likely it is to actually be virulent. So in order for you to get an infection, you would purposely have to have a large number of virus left there on the counter, you immediately touch it, and then you go and touch your face with it and directly inhale that into your sinus. To this day, despite the 5.4 million infections, we have not yet identified anyone who has gotten COVID-19 from touching an infected surface. So even though it is good to know and understand that the virus can settle on particle surfaces and how long it stays and lasts, it's important for us to obviously maintain good hygiene in the environment, um, but still the number one transmission and how you get COVID-19 remains respiratory. That is droplet as well as aerosol. So let's talk about the slide. It is a rather busy slide, but it has a lot of information. And I think that if you can understand how this virus behaves, how it causes inflammation, then you can understand how we're gonna be able to treat it and how we can mitigate our risk. So let's look at the slide on top here, which is A, how the COVID-19 enters into your respiratory cells. So if you look at the microscopic picture of COVID-19, you see that it has these spikes. These spikes are called the S protein or the M protein or spikes. And it makes this virus particularly efficient at attaching itself to the ACE receptor you see there. These ACE receptors are basically attached to your sinus tracts as well as the epithelial lining of your lungs. So some medications for high blood pressure inhibits this particular receptor. And this may be important, and we are studying this still. So I'm pointing out a few things for you as we go along here as far as targets for potential treatment. But this virus attaches itself in the sinus, in your lungs. It enters, and it uses your own body to replicate, where it self-reproduces in the millions and millions of copies. The more copies that it makes, the sicker you become. And the reason for that is you will go into part B, the bottom screen there, where you'll see the early stage of COVID-19. Once the virus gets replicated and it releases all these viruses called variants into your, your bloodstream, then your system, your own immune system start to react to it. So the part where the virus releases the, into your body, that is known as viral shedding. And I'll get more into that process here in the next few slides. But just know that the minute the virus gets released into the bloodstream, your body has an immune response. 
and there are two different types. The first one is going to immediately react by introducing and releasing what we call special chemicals to try and attack this virus. So I'll point out to you that these types of reactions or special chemicals, their names are listed here. You'll see the TNF-alpha, the IL-1, and IL-6. I'm pointing this out to you specifically because later on when I talk about treatment, you will understand why specifically we are using some of these medications the way we are to target these. So these special chemicals then produces more inflammation. So from the picture, what you're seeing is your body is producing a significant amount of inflammatory response to try and fight off this virus. As the disease gets worse and patients get sicker, what you'll see is that the body now becomes so overwhelmed with the inflammatory response that the membrane gets permeable. And if you look, you'll see that the increase in permeability allows the blood vessels to flow into the lung, causing a condition we call pulmonary edema, which is fluid-filled lungs. You also see that because as part of the inflammatory response, you'll see a cascade of reaction where it activates your own body's ability to um, cause blood clots. And I won't get into specific details about why that is happening, but just know that the formation of blood clot is a huge complication in COVID. And this is precisely why, is because your own body is trying to fight off this virus. So the complications and the death that you see from COVID-19 is not necessarily from the virus. It is our own body's immune system from fighting the virus itself. So viral shedding, you've heard me say this word quite a few times. So what exactly is it? So initially when the virus goes in and attacks your own nasal uh, cells as well as your lungs, you'll see that around day two or three of the time when you're exposed to before you actually have symptoms, this is when the virus starts to get released into the bloodstream. And that is when it gets shed from your own cells to the outer part of your body. And that's what we call viral shedding. Viral shedding is what makes you infectious, okay? And just remember it happens before you have symptoms. I'm pointing this out to you because later I will tell you why it is important that we wear a mask and it is precisely because of this phenomenon called viral shedding. It's before we ever even know we have the disease, this virus is already starting to peak in terms of its transmission and its infection. So pre-symptomatic transmission is basically anyone who has been in contact with someone who has COVID but does not know they have COVID before they have symptoms. These patients usually will develop symptoms later about maybe one to three days after uh, they've had, they do or have been in contact with somebody. This is different than patients who are asymptomatic, meaning that these patients never even know they carry the virus, never have any symptoms, didn't even know they had it, and they're walking around healthy with nothing. You will ask me why that is, and this will take an hour to explain, but I will do the best I can later to explain why that is. So I alluded to earlier that part of the problem with COVID is that our immune system is doing the best that it can to try and fight. So we have two different types of an immune response. We have the innate and the adaptive. The reason I'm bringing this slide up and calling it to your attention is that in order for you to understand how vaccines work, you have to understand your immune response first. So your innate immune response is the immediate response. That's what you saw in the earlier slide. When the virus comes in and attacks your body, we have our beautiful skin to protect us. We have the mucosa of lung linings to protect us. And in the first phase, our immune response immediately, when it becomes invaded with a foreign host or a, a, a virus, it just starts on attack mode. It will send out all the signals that it needs to for everything to respond, and it's on literally a hunt. You're, I'm coming, you need to come and get me help as soon as possible. So it's non-specific, but it's quick. The adaptive immune response is slower to respond. However, the adaptive immune response is what we need to develop long-term immunity. 
it develops antibodies. And vaccines are a big part of this because when we develop vaccine, we allow memory cells to develop, therefore creating immunity. The adaptive immune response creates memory cells. This is one reason why some of us have certain illnesses that we only get once in a lifetime. Once we get it, we don't get it again because our bodies remember them, they develop memory cells so that if it comes and attacks us a second time, the body knows exactly how to kill this virus. So the adaptive immune response is critical in the development of memory T cells and is critical in the vaccines. So now that you have an understanding of exactly how this virus gets to you, what are the symptoms? So the symptoms in the hospitalized patients that I see, the majority of them are fever, cough, shortness of breath, myalgia, which is basically muscle aches and pains, fatigue, GI symptoms of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headaches and weakness, rhinorrhea, which is another fancy word for runny nose, and anosmia, which is the inability to smell, and ibusia, which is inability to taste. So you lose both taste and smell, and roughly 3% of patients report that. Anorexia is weight loss, and patients have also report weight loss. So in looking at the timeline of this disease, this disease is none I've ever seen. In the medical hospital in the setting, I don't see patients in the first seven days of their symptoms. I see them after the seven days of symptoms when they become severe. So if you go back and just kind of picture that slide I had of the pathophysiology of the severity of disease, at the bottom of that slide, I explained that as it gets worse, your membranes get permeable and you end up with pulmonary edema, which is swelling of the lungs amongst other things. So that usually occurs at around day number 10 or 11 of an illness. So for the, for the most part, the incubation period, as we discussed, is the period before anyone ever has any symptoms. You don't know you have it. Day zero is a day that you have symptoms. And for the most part, all the symptoms are listed. By the time you're through with day number seven, most patients usually do well. And if you're able to pass day number 10 or so without having any symptoms of shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, you should do well. 40% of patients, however, that have COVID develop shortness of breath by day number seven, which is why I say patients don't see me when they have the symptoms of first seven days. They come to the hospital because they cannot breathe. And the large part are hypoxic and they need oxygen. And that is the reason why I admit most of them to the hospital. Of those patients, 14% have really severe illnesses and 5% of them are critical. That means these patients are in the intensive care unit on life support. So looking at the triad of uh, the triangle of this disease, roughly 80% of patients that have this are either asymptomatic or mild cases. But you get to the later, the upper part of the triangle, and you'll see 14% of them have severe diseases and roughly 5% death as far as mortality for this disease. So what are complications? This slide looks uh, pretty uh, awful as far as complications are concerned. And if you go back and think about what I said about the pathophysiology of this disease, you can understand why these are complications. So the most common is pneumonia, followed by acute respiratory failure, which is inability to breathe. You also can get liver failure, uh, kidney failure, heart attacks, strokes, um, you name it, the list goes on. The, the worst complication from this disease, however, is a cytokine storm, which doctors refer to. If you get this, the mortality is 100%. And what cytokine storm is, is basically your body is so it's overcome with this virus and it's trying to fight it so hard that it releases all these chemicals these macrophages lymphocytes t cells to try and fight off this disease and the overwhelming in inflammatory markers and inflammation in each organ causes multi-organ failure so if this happens and you develop a cytokine storm in COVID 19 you will not survive So here, I'd like to show off some imaging studies. Uh, you can see that on a top part, a normal CT scan, both the top and the bottom are normal. In a normal looking CT, uh, basically the lungs are black. 
So you have that this indicates air is supposed to be. You also see that the heart is nice and white because we gave this person contrast. So blood should be nice and white here on the CT scan. On the outside is basically your muscle. So this, this is a considered a normal looking CAT scan. And if you also see in the bronchial tree is black, that's because that's air. It's supposed to be black and that is normal. Here is imaging studies of someone who's got COVID-19 pneumonia with ARDS. You can see on the top A and B that it is not nice and black. The lungs are completely covered. And if a radiologist were to read this, it, they would say this is bilateral. In other words, both lungs, brown patchy infiltrates. And that's exactly where it is. It's patchy and it's in both lungs and it's ground glass. So you look at C and D, um, you can see that it's, it's looking almost nodular. Um, it's not at all nicely uniform. So this is a classic picture of COVID-19 pneumonia and ARDS. And I chose this picture because it looks exactly like my 85 year old that had this COVID-19. Hers was actually even a little worse and it covers almost all of her lungs. Um, so this is a classic picture. Now in the microscopic level, you can see a huge difference as well. So on the top part there, you can kind of see the A and B of the disease. And then you can see on C, that's a normal lung. The alveoli mm -hmm. is this white area here that you see. That's your alveoli. That's the area where gas is exchanged between carbon monoxide and oxygen as it should be. The area around that is the lining of your alveoli, and that's normal. It's nice and thin. It allows air to be exchanged. A lot of white. That just means air, right? But look at D. D is completely engrossed with inflammation. You no longer see alveoli. The alveoli are gone. The lung lining is gone. It is now covered with nothing but inflammation. The pink spots that you see as well as the red, all of this here, this is all inflammation. This is what we see in patients with ARDS, and this is the reason why patients become extremely hypoxic and they don't have enough oxygen. This here is a picture of an MRI of someone who's had a massive stroke. So a normal uh, head MRI, you should be able to see nice gray density. That's normal, healthy brain. The white is the area that is deprived of oxygenation and blood. So this person had a massive right upper temporal lobe uh, stroke. Here again is another CT scan. And as I said before, the lung should be nice and black, and it is. And I also said to you earlier that blood vessels should be nice and white. But look at this CT scan. You see right smack in the upper corner here, a nice blob of grayness. That is a blood clot, and it is rather a big blood clot. This is a pulmonary embolism, otherwise known as blood clot to your lungs. Not only does this person have blood clot on the left, they also have one over here on the right in the small um, artery as well. And it looks to me like also in the middle, they have a clot there. So somebody has a saddle in the light, and this is deadly. Um, this basically, this blood clot can be sitting right in the middle between where the two branches separate. And if you don't get immediate treatment, uh, patients will die. Now, how do you diagnose somebody with COVID-19 now that we're all scared about the complications, right? Um, there are multiple ways that you can get tests now. So the most common is the nasopharyngeal, which is a swab your nose. Um, the oropharyngeal is the mouth. And the most, the best test with the best result is a BAL. And what that is, is a bronchial alveolar lavage. It is a procedure done by a lung doctor where they go down with a the camera, they flush out your lung, and they take the sample. And the reason that is the best test is because it goes deep and you get really good specimen, but it is invasive. And so we don't do it. The only time we will do that is if you're in the hospital and you need us to do that. But for the most part, the two most common remains nasopharyngeal and oral swabs. The FDA also just gave its uh, approval for a saliva test as well last week. So that should be hitting the market pretty soon. So I've had a lot of people ask me, 
Well, why do I get a false negative? And the reason is because the person that's doing the task is not doing it correctly. I am showing you this picture, again, from the Women of Journal of Medicine on the appropriate way to get a nasal pharyngeal swab. If you ever have to have this test, I want you to remember one thing and one thing from this lecture. And that is that in order for you to know that someone is doing the test correctly, the swab has to go all the way up into your eyeballs. If you do not feel that swab hitting in the back of your eyeball and up your nose, that person is not getting adequate sample. So if you can see the picture, the swab is pretty deep, okay? Um, so my husband unfortunately has had this done and he, he came home and said, I felt like somebody just grinded my brain out because literally it's, it's all the way up. So if you're getting a swab and that person is just swabbing on the outside, tell them to go deeper because if the test comes back and it's false negative, that does not mean you did not have COVID. It just meant that the testing was not adequate. So what do you do if you ever come back with a positive test? So the CDC is recommending you isolate for 10 days after your symptom or three days after you, your symptoms have improved. This recommendation has not changed despite the numerous um, things that we see as far as the COVID positivity. So I will leave you with a, a, a caveat. My patients are older than 65, actually a lot of them are 80s, have been consistently positive for COVID for months. This has been known now for a long time. So despite the fact that we've been able to um, resuscitate one of my patients who's 85 years old on a ventilator for five weeks, prone, paralyzed, almost died, uh, she actually was able to be saved. And despite being saved and have had multiple x-rays that are normal, she's been off oxygen she has continually tested positive for COVID-19 three months out from her original symptom. So we are not recommending that patients remain in quarantine for three months until you test negative. As a matter of fact, the CDC just updated their information as well. And they are saying based on their studies, they are also growing this in the virus as well, the cultures. And after eight days, it appears that um, most people, the viral shedding doesn't really happen after that. So they are standing by the fact that beyond the 10 days, you don't need to have extended quarantine. Once your symptoms resolve, you may wear a mask and go back into general society. Exactly for the reasons that I explained is you cannot test continuously because these patients will stay longer. The sicker they are, the longer it will take for the test to clear. If you suspect that you've been in contact with someone who's had COVID, what do you do? Um, you should quarantine yourself before you ever even get your test results back. And the reason for that is in the community setting, uh, some of us have been lucky and we've gotten our test results back in two or three days. Some of us took a week. So we are not gonna have you go walking around the streets if there is a chance that you were exposed to someone with COVID. So for that reason, if you know that you might have been exposed to someone and they've already been confirmed COVID positive, please do the responsible thing and quarantine yourself for 14 days, despite what the test results may show. So now um, let's move on to treatment. I've listed a long laundry list of treatment that I'm sure many of you have not heard except for hydroxychloroquine. So let's go and discuss some of this very briefly. The main treatment for COVID is still oxygen therapy. Now you notice on all my slides, I do the best I can to cite all the information and where I got it from. This particular author cited 75% of hospitalized patients need oxygen. That in fact to me is, is underestimated. In my experience, I don't admit patients in a hospital unless they need oxygen. So 100% of my patients are hypoxic when they come into the hospital, 100% need oxygen. The question is how much oxygen and how severe are they? We have categories for them. If you are mild, um, you put pretty much down in the one or two liters. By the time you get up to six, you're considered moderate. Beyond that, between six and 15 liters is considered moderate. Once you become severely hypoxic and you need to be on a ventilator, that is considered a severe case and you need to be on life support. Proning. 
Have you heard of proning, Mrs. Mora? No, I, yeah, most, most general public have not. But proning is something that we've done in med medicine for years and years and decades. We use it particularly for patients in ARDS, which is the acute respiratory distress syndrome that we talked about. And we don't use it for everybody on a ventilator unless we have problem oxygenating them. And if you recall, when someone is in ARDS, there is overwhelming amount of inflammation into your lung tissues. And if you look at that microscopic picture and think back of those pink, um, the, you know, the little microscopic and neutrophils that you see on there, it's not allowing us to oxygenate you. So we can give you 100% high flow, high pressure oxygen, we're still not gonna be able to oxygenate you. And the reason is because when the lungs get scarred, it becomes extremely stiff and it's not compliant. So what we found is that if we actually lie you on your belly, we lower the pressure of your chest and we lower the lung pressure. And when we do that, we actually get better oxygenation. So one of the things that we've done um, in ARDS is we've done plumbing for many, many years. It works extremely well, but it is also extremely invasive. We paralyze you and we use a special machine to turn you upside down for 18 hours. So you're completely paralyzed. You're completely sedated. You don't know that we're doing this to you because you're severely ill. In COVID at my hospital, we implement a self cloning protocol for patients who are awake, alert, and oriented. If you're able to prone, this does improve your oxygen significantly. Multiple studies, even though they've been very small, has been consistent in showing that proning helps to reduce hypoxia and improve your oxygenation. So proning basically means you lie on your belly, as the picture shows, for 30 minutes. And then after that, you lie on your right side for 30, you sit up for 30, you lay on your left side for 30, and at the end of the two hours, you repeat the cycle again. We recommend you do this for 12 hours if you're able to by yourself. However, in my experience, my patients cannot do this. At the best day, perhaps some of them may be able to do it a few times a day. I can always tell if someone is following orders and proning because their oxygen will remarkably improve very quickly. For those that do not, I can also tell because they get significantly worse. So this is a cheap way to treat a patient and also has been very effective as well. Zinc is a mineral that many of you have already heard of. It is everywhere. It's in our reproductive, vascular, as well as nervous system. And if you're deficient in zinc, um, especially in children, there's an increased risk for infection. Zinc is also known for an anti-inflammatory effect, particularly in the lungs and for pneumonia. So what we have shown is in a, in a study in 2002, this was when SARS hit, in the laboratory setting, they were able to show that zinc actually blocked the enzyme that is responsible for replicating the SARS. And as a result of this, we have used zinc in my hospital uh, as well as part of our treatment. It, the standard dose is 200 milligram once a day um, for the treatment. Vitamin C, all of us are familiar with, um, it is a vitamin that we use to lower the risk of infection. Interestingly, doctors in China, when this outbreak first occurred, noted that patients who took vitamin C did way better than those who did not. So it led them to start a clinical trial. They started the clinical trial in February, and they were giving patients two grams of vitamin C in the uh, IV. And the study should be published out in September to see whether or not vitamin C uh, versus no treatment is better or not. So I'm, I'll be waiting for that result to come. Yes. Uh, sorry. So, so two grams of vitamin C, they, they, they've been trying that. What's a normal dose of vitamin C? Uh, if you buy over the counter, James asked me, what is the normal dose of vitamin C? It's 500 milligrams. So if you buy uh, the vitamin C over the counter, it should be about 500. Now, in the hospital setting, and, and what you'll see here is, um, and I'll, I'll allude to here is, so far we haven't had any clinical research to say that vitamin C should be used because there's nothing in the medical literature that says it works as a standalone treatment, okay? But it's interesting though that before COVID hit, we had a meta-analysis. In other words, a meta-analysis is a, a study or paper that looks at all the studies of vitamin C and they combine it together. 
And in this particular meta-analysis, it did show that if you use vitamin C in a critical ill patient on a ventilator, you actually reduce the length of stay in the hospital and the length of stay in the ICU by 8.6%. And if you actually use vitamin C in someone on a ventilator, you actually lower their duration on the ventilator by 18%. So there may be something to that, but again, I don't have any medical scientific literature that says vitamin C alone without anything else is going to cure you or one way or the other. Having said that, because vitamin C has been shown to at least help reduce infections, and as part of the protocol in my hospital, we are also giving vitamin C, but not at two grams. We give 500 milligrams twice a day, so for one gram. That's in combination with zinc. So. Hydroxychloroquine, boy, what can I say? Um, there's been much debate about it in the media. And prior to this, hydroxychloroquine has been around since 1955 when it was first approved by the FDA for the use of malaria. And since then, when uh, during World War II, when they used it so much, they also noted that patients with rheumatoid arthritis and lupus has significant improvement in their symptoms from the use. So now, in addition to malaria, lupus and RA has also been added as an indication for its use. So to this day, controversy exists. And I will just be brief and say that there has been over 200 clinical trials on the use of hydroxychloroquine. They have all had variations of success as well as disappointments. The gold standard for medical research continues to be a double-blinded, randomized clinical control study. And what that means is that the investigator and the patients do not know what they are getting. So it's double-blinded and it's randomized. So patients don't know what they're going to be getting, whether it's treatment or no treatment. So that continues to be the goal, the standard of care, the standard as far as medical research. The hydroxychloroquine studies that have been out, out there, some of them have been double-blinded randomized, but the trial size has been extremely small. Some of them have shown hydroxychloroquine to be efficient and effective, but it is not a double-blinded clinical randomized clinical control study. So to this day, we don't have any evidence to support its use. We initially used it early on in the pandemic for patients. But I don't think hydroxychloroquine has a role in a patient when they are so severe enough that they need to be in the hospital. Supporters of its use say that if you use it early, the minute that you have symptoms a few days after symptom onset, it's been shown to be beneficial in an outpatient setting. Um, but again, I don't have any data to support that. The WHO has since pulled hydroxychloroquine out of the solidarity trial because it's not effective. So I think we're gonna see much more out of this controversy than what already is out there. Uh, lipinavir and ritonavir, it, these are combination antiretrovirals used in this treatment of HIV. However, it is not beneficial. Multiple studies, even though they are small, did not show any benefit. And to my knowledge, I don't think any of us has ever even used these medications for the treatment of um, COVID. And this has led also WHO in July to pull this medication off of one of its um, studies as well. Remdesivir, you've all heard of this now by now, I'm sure. Remdesivir is a antiviral that was first developed for the treatment of Ebola. It never got clinical indi indication for the FDA. So even though we are using it, this drug has no FDA approval for any use right now. What it has been shown in the laboratory setting is that it does have activity against MERS, SARS, and now COVID-19. One of the biggest studies that came out recently, and you see I cited the study, the preliminary results of over 1,000 patients given either remdesivir or no treatment alone, you see that it did not improve mortality, but it did lower the length of stay in the hospital. So patients who receive remdesivir, either five days or 10 day course, they leave the hospital four days earlier. I highlighted the fact that this did not improve mortality, okay? However, I haven't said that again, Gilead is right now doing six different studies regarding remdesivir. 
And one of them, they added um, INF alpha, which I alluded to at the beginning also, is one of those inflammatory markers with a combination use of remdesivir to see whether or not it has any use in, in COVID-19. That is ongoing. In addition to that, they promised there will be a second study published sometime in September regarding mortality data. So there will be more to come on this drug. So in the hospital setting, we are using remdesivir for patients with severe COVID. Severe meaning that you have to have at least, I would say moderate to severe, um, at least six liters of oxygen on high flow to be able to receive this medication. So IL-6 inhibitors, I kind of gave out that name earlier for you. And this is again, one of those inflammatory markers. Um, IL-6 uh, inhibitors, there are two drugs in particular, tocilizumab and seraluzumab. They have been uh, used in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, there has been one study that came out out of China looking at 100 patients on tocilizumab against no treatment, and that did not show any benefit. However, mm -hmm. there is another study coming out in the next few weeks, and it's looking at the effectiveness of this drug. So hopefully I'll have more data soon. In the hospital setting, just like anything else, we reserve the use of tocilizumab for severe cases. So when you are severe, we will throw the kitchen sink at you with everything we've got. And this is one of them. So more to come on this particular drug. We'll know more. Convalescent plasma received some attention on Sunday when President Trump announced that it's now been made uh, as emergent use. We were already using it before he actually announced it. The problem, however, with convalescent plasma is it is just very difficult to obtain. At the hospital in the past five months, we've only used it on two patients. And it's particularly because it's difficult for us to get the blood from um, the talent, which is one of the centers that is here to be able to get the, the plasma. I'm hoping now that it's been approved for urgent use that perhaps we will have a better handle and be able to use it a little bit more. I haven't said that too. Um, they also did a study earlier in the pandemic of 103 patients using convalescent plasma for no treatment. And again, they did not show any improvement in mortality uh, or even the length of stay for COVID patients. But the number was so significantly small that you really can't make heads or tails how this will go. So we are promised there will be another trial coming out soon with bigger numbers of patients using convalescent plasma to see if this is going to be a benefit so again, more to come. Now, so you're gonna ask me, this is all gloom and doom. Nothing's worked, right? <sighs> Except for one, steroids. The only treatment that has been shown to be of any clinical benefit in improving your chance of surviving this disease is steroid, and in particular, dexamethasone. It is cheap, it's $10 per treatment. That is the best news that I think I can hear. So the benefit, is greatest if you are the sickest. So if you're in uh, on a ventilator or if you've had symptoms for more than seven days, steroids has been shown to be superior and reduce your mortality rate. The incidence of death in patients that are on life support um, is lowered by 12% uh, from then those who did not use steroids. So this is the recovery trial. This was big in medicine. This is kind of the news we we're all waiting to hear. Um, if you are sick at home with mild symptoms, we do not give you steroids. And that is because even though steroids has been shown to be beneficial in all categories, except for those with very low mild symptoms or no symptoms at all, because steroids have side effects and it has more side effects than benefits. So therefore we do not recommend it. So needless to say, if you have COVID, um, your outpatient doctors may not prescribe this to you because it hasn't been beneficial. But in the inpatient setting, I will tell you, ever since this, the study came out, we have been prescribing it across the board on all of our patients the minute they hit the door. And that is just because it's been shown that they do survive. And at this point, this is exactly what we are trying to go for, is anything that will lower your risk of death from this disease. So certainly this is a spike, I would say a bright spot in the current treatment that we have right now. So let's look at the mortality. Um, if you have COVID, what is your mortality? If you end up in the hospital 
60 to 90% of patients that have COVID have a comorbid condition. The most common comorbid condition listed is hypertension, followed by obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, kidney problem, cancer, and liver disease. If you are in the hospital, your risk of dying from this disease is 15 to 20%. If you end up in the ICU, it is 40%. If you are in the hospital, and you are less than 40 years old, your risk of death is roughly 5% or less. But if you notice, it goes up to 60% if you are age 80 to 89 years of age. So this disease is not kind to patients who are older. So look, I'm gonna let, look at some statistics with you here. I think if you look at these, you'll find some very interesting things. I got this, uh, this uh, slide was on Saturday. This is the most recent that I can find here. We're about 5.6 million infected. California is the number one state with the most number of cases. This is the exact same slide, except this time I changed the parameters to total deaths. New York City, despite having fewer cases, still remains top of the chart with the most number of deaths. Does anybody want to take a guess as to why that is? Based on what I just told you. Population. That's right, the elderly population. The average uh, age in New York City is 80. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, of those who died. Yeah. So this is from the CDC, uh, also from Saturday. You can see cases by age group and cases of death by age group. I think this, this particular slide really kind of paints the picture of who's most likely to get the disease and who's most likely to die from the disease. If you look at the red, that is not the people that are getting the disease. The majority of them are between the ages of 18 to 49, really. The more, than, more than half of the cases are within those age groups. But yet, overwhelmingly, the number of deaths I would say if you add up 65, 75, and 85 years of age, you are looking at more than 60% of deaths from COVID are in that age group. So if you're 65 and older, this disease is not kind. By race, across the board in every state in the United States, the Latino population and the uh, Blacks are hit extremely hard by this disease. They are more likely than other uh, race and ethnicities to die from this disease. You'll ask me why, and that's another hour lecture, but in brief, it is basically due to access of healthcare, risk factors, um, and just health in general. California, you'll look here, Los Angeles County is still the number one uh, as far as the number of cases and infections. And if you look at who's infected, Children zero to 17 is at 10%, but the overwhelming majority of people, again, infected is 18 to 49 years old. 65% uh, is at 11%, so 65 and older. So they're about the same as far as the number of infection as children, but look at the number of deaths. 74%, 65 and older will die from this disease despite having the exact same number of infection as children ages zero to 17. That is overwhelming data, and it's not just California alone. It is, this is replicated worldwide. You'll also see under mortality and death between males and females. We have an even 50-50 split as to who gets infected, but males are the ones more likely to die. Why that is, I don't know but universally across the board in all countries, this remains true. So the Riverside data, uh, again, I think you, if you look at it, is very similar to the California as well as to the United States. Again, males most likely to die, age 65 and older likely to die, despite the fact that overwhelmingly 60% of Riverside County infection rates are between ages of 18 to 49. So this mirrors everybody else. And here's a Riverside comorbid condition. 60% uh, of those who have died from COVID in Riverside County have a comorbid condition. That is either diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, uh, some sort of a neurologic or kidney problem. So again, this echoes everyone else. 
the death statistics is pretty much the same by age group. Even amongst younger children and, and patients who died between 15 and 24, 67% of them have a comorbid medical condition. So if you have any of those comorbid conditions, you are either in the moderate or a high risk group uh, from this disease. So let's briefly talk about antibodies and what that means. We are finding currently in medical literature that the antibodies are not lasting very long. Um, they, at the most, the more severe you have the disease, the longer the antibodies will last. Patients who are asymptomatic, because they have a less chance of the virus, less copies, they're less sick, the antibodies are not sticking around very long. This has extreme, this has a, replications as far as what, what we're going to be able to do with the, with the vaccine. So there's going to be much more to come as far as what does it mean with the antibody? And if we do have a vaccine, how long will that last? So these are questions that remain unanswered at this time. So let's move on really quickly to children and how they are different than adults. They have their own set of complications. So at this time, we have about 2 to 5% um, of kids being infected from COVID-19. And the majority of them have very mild symptoms. Basically, some of them don't even know they have symptoms. That just because they, they're thinking maybe it's like a, a viral cold or a, an illness. Um, right now, less than 7% of those children infected need to go to the hospital compared to adults with significantly uh, less mortality. You probably have recently heard of a very rare condition called uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And this occurs in children who've been infected with COVID-19 anywhere from two to four weeks after their initial exposure. It is also an inflammatory response that the body gives. And the, the children usually develop a multiple uh, constellation of symptoms, which I will get to in a minute. It mimics a condition we've known about called Kawasaki's disease. And I'll tell you here what that is here. So the other thing that's interesting about children is multiple studies worldwide have looked at how the children are getting the disease. Are they transmitting it? Or are they getting it from their parents? This latest one came out of um, Switzerland and they looked at 40 households with children that have had the infection recently. And if you, if you look at the to totality of, of how they were getting it, um, you'll see here that 79% of the cases got it because one of the adults in the family had the COVID before the child. And the child was simply getting it because their adult parents were giving it to them. So this echoes another one that was done by the CDC about three weeks ago that pretty much says very similar things, that children are not transmitting the disease. Again, I, I look at them very much closely like the asymptomatics. Because their viral count and the amount of virus they have in their system may be less, they are not transmitting it at more. Um, so the viral shedding phase is less than someone who's actually got the acute severe infection. The other thing that the CDC noticed as well is children from zero to eight years of old do not transmit any of these disease. But once you hit the age of 10, they're starting to see some transmitters among children greater than 10 years of age. You'll ask me why that is. I, my thinking and hypothesis is perhaps it's because the immune system is mature when the kid turns 10. And so once your immune system becomes mature, you mount a lot more of a fight. And that may be why we, we may be seeing a little bit more of a transmission in 10 years or older. But regardless, across the board, it, despite all these studies being extremely small, they are showing consistently the same data that kids are not giving it it's that they were getting it from the adults um, rather than the other way around. They're also less likely to be sick, perhaps for a variety of reasons. One of them is the ACE receptors that I talked about early on, how the virus attaches itself to the ACE receptors. There was one study that looked at the fact that kids had lower levels of ACE in their sinuses than adults. And this is perhaps the reason why there's less of an infection than, than the adults. So there are multiple what we think is hypothesis for that. So let's talk now about this syndrome that I alluded to earlier. We have about 1,000 cases reported worldwide of children having this disease, and it occurs anywhere from two to four weeks after the initial COVID infection. This is a lot rarer. It's about 200,000 cases compared to actually children 
less than 21 years old, they had a higher incidence, anywhere from 322 cases per 100,000. So this is extremely rare condition, but because it is rare and is noted, we do have to be aware of it as providers. And again, Hispanics, Blacks, and Asian children tend to be infected by this particular disease. So what is it? It is basically an overwhelming inflammatory syndrome that for the most part affects every single organ. The primary organ that it affects is the heart. Kawasaki, if it's a straight up pure Kawasaki's disease, it tends to go for the heart muscles more than any organ, but in MISC, it can occur in lung as well as kidney, liver, as well as the heart. So it is multi-system. That's why it's called multi-system. It affects every single organ. And in it, straight up Kawasaki disease rare, rarely happens in children less than five years old, but associated with COVID, you can see it in young children as, as young as actually up to 21 years of age. So there is some, um, some differences between the two. So the treatment for this is steroids and IVIG. So let's look at these pictures. What is it? So children with Kawasaki's disease will have a strawberry tongue. Their tongue is just beet red with spots that look like strawberries. Then you also have the red eyes and that's because the blood vessels are affected. So once your blood vessels are affected, every organ is affected, including you know, your heart as well as everywhere else. So this is what you see in a child with Kawasaki's. You also see their hands and feet peeling, and you also see red swollen hands and feet as well. So these are classic Kawasaki disease. And this, is, this may be what you see in a child with COVID-related MISC syndrome. So let's go now and finish up our talk on how do you mitigate your risk? And to me, life is about mitigating our risk, right? We take risks, but we also want to mitigate risk. So how do we do that? I'm sure you're tired of hearing these three things, but I really can't stress them enough. Social distance, wear your mask and wash your hands with soap and water. Notice here, I did not write hand sanitizers. And the reason for that is hand sanitizers do not kill a good portion of spores and anaerobes. So, so hand sanitizers are a good substitute if you don't have access to a soap and water, but the, you still should, if you can, wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds or more. Also, if you buy hand sanitizers, be aware that the FDA has multiple recalls right now because of fakes and knockoffs. Uh, people are adding methanol to the hand sanitizers, and that has caused poisoning in some patients. So please be aware if you're going to buy hand sanitizers, make sure you go to the FDA.gov website and that check and see that that product is not on the recall list. Okay? Yes, James. Uh, does the soap that you wash your hands with, does it have to be antibacterial? No. That's just a gimmick. Uh, all soaps, if you use them, as long as you wash your hands uh, for 20 seconds or more, that should be adequate for cleaning um, your hands. Uh, boy crowds, I think that goes without saying. That's why we're doing a virtual lecture today. Um, maintain your cleaning working environment, like we discussed about the possibility of surface contamination. Um, at work, what I do is before I ever even touch anything, I take my um, sandy cloth wipes and wipe down my workstations, computers, laptops, keyboards, my stethoscopes, all that before I even sit down. At the end of the day, I do the same thing. Um, so just make sure you maintain a work clean environment. Never touch your face, obviously with good reason, right? And this year, it, particularly this year, please get a flu vaccine. I have heard it from patients for the last 15 years. Flu vaccines don't work for me, Dr. Louie. I take it, it makes me sick. I'm gonna tell you what, the last thing you want this year is to get the flu and COVID-19. If you get both at the same time, there is no saving you. And I really literally mean that. This year, it is more than ever critical for us to stay healthy and do our part at preventative medicine. That includes getting a flu vaccine. They might predict 100% accuracy this year, which I'm praying for. But even if they get 50% right this year on the flu vaccine, that is a hell of a lot better than not being protected at all. So please, for the life of me this year, your children and you need to get the flu vaccine. Dr. Yes. Is there such a thing as getting it too early in the season? No. 
Um, so Sister Ernestine asked, is it such a thing as getting the flu vaccine early? And my answer is no. And I will say that I get my kids vaccinated usually by the end of August when the vaccine is first available to prevent the first wave of the flu because you don't know when it's going to hit. Usually the season starts anywhere early September, depending on the region. And then later on in the year, it can last longer depending on the strain yearly. So we don't know what the strain yet. Uh, and right now the flu vaccine is not yet available. It should be in the next few weeks. I just checked it. They're offering it already at CVS. Well, they may have, but my children's pediatrician's office doesn't have it yet. <laughs> so go figure. CVS has it, but my children's pediatrician office tells me they don't have it yet. Uh, so if, it, if they do have it at CVS, I really would urge all of you to go get it. I just um, the the other thing that is controversial um, is wearing of a mask. Okay, I don't see why that is controversial, and I'll present to you evidence on why we do need to wear a mask. But why do we even wear a need to wear a mask? And how did that even get started? So initially, the surgeons in the 1850s noted that he had a lot of infections for his patients, and he didn't understand why. At the time, nobody wore a mask. So he started wearing a mask and noticed that it reduced a significant amount of surgical post-op complications, including infection. So since 1920, as part of the standard routine uh, uniform for surgeons, we wear a surgical mask in the OR, everybody. And the reason is because spit, our mouth, is a dirty place. It has tons of bacteria. So if you can imagine, you're opening up a patient, there's a wound, there's a big gigantic wound, and you're talking amongst yourselves in the OR. You're spitting all of this bacteria and aura into an open surgical wound. That is just an increased risk for infection, and that is why we wear masks in the OR. Doctors also wear masks because we want to prevent transmission of disease. If we know a patient has an infectious disease like TB, we don't go in there not wearing a mask. We wear it because we don't want to get it. So that is the reason why we wear it. For COVID, the reason why you all need to wear a mask is because you are trying to prevent yourself from possibly transmitting this disease unknowingly to another person. We talk a lot about pre-symptomatics. We talk a lot about asymptomatic early on in this presentation. And you can understand that before you ever even know you have this particular virus, you are already, this virus is in you, it is replicating, and it is infectious. So I think as a personal responsibility, it is all of us' job to take care of each other and ourselves and wear a mask. For those of you who are still not convinced that the mask is going to lower your risk of, ex of actually getting it, let me show you a really good study that was just published recently. This was done by um, Mary Brigham University in Massachusetts. They had 12 hospitals and 75,000 employees. That is a huge number. Now, if you look in the pink section, March 6th to March 25th, before they implemented universal masking, Universal masking not only includes the providers wearing the mask and staff, but also patients. Everybody in the hospital was requiring a mask. They started that on the 25th. Before they instituted the universal masking, they had an infection rate as high as 21% a day. After they instituted the universal masking, you can see in the green between April to 11 to the 29th, the numbers started declining. So they went from roughly having about an average of 4% infection down to less than 0.4% infection. So it is a significant decline at reducing the transmission of COVID at their 12 hospitals. So it does work provided we use it adequately and safely and we know how to put it on and take it off. So now that you're convinced you're gonna wear a mask, we have another problem. Which one do we wear? Because there's tons of them out there and the, it's important to know which material is going to give you the best protection. The N95 is still the gold standard because it does filter out 95% of all particles. The surgical mask is the next one. However, the cloth mask, Duke University just released a study two weeks ago. They looked at 29 different types of masks and the best one was still very similar. It's a cloth mask, three layer cloth mask. So if you have a good cloth mask that has three layers, it is going to give you as good of a protection as a surgical mask. The least effective is a bandana. 
So if you need to wear a facial covering, a bandana is not going to be it. So how do you wear a mask? I have seen people wear masks in all different shapes and all different sizes. I just thought I'd give you guys a good laugh and look at some of these lawmakers wear a mask. The first one wore it over his face. In order for the mask to be appropriately worn, you should always have the mask covering your nose and your entire mouth, this whole area. You should never have the mask cover any other part of your face but your mouth and your nose. Um, <laughs> I, I'm laughing at, at um, Nadler there with the mask on top of his forehead. I've seen the mask also on people's faces, their necks, their head. The reason you don't want to do this is because you're contaminating your mask. So if you can imagine, the mask is between you and spit, and then on the outside is exposed to the outside world. If you're touching the inside of your mask, you have contaminated your mask with your dirty hands. If you take the mask and you put it on your head, you have just contaminated your inside of your mask with whatever it is that's on your head. And I've also seen people when they eat, take their mask and put it down on their neck and chewing food and having food particles be on the inside of their mask and then breathing that in. So please, if you're going to take off your mask and eat, do it correctly. So how does that, how is that? So first to wear a mask, give me one minute. I'm gonna show you here. So to effectively wear a mask, take the two earlobes and actually put it on like this. And then pinch your nose and make sure it's completely tight on. Okay, this is how it should be done. I did not touch the inside of my mask, I touched the earlobes. If you have to take it off because you need to eat or you gotta breathe, you can do one of two things. You can just take off one earlobe and then when you're ready to, to put it back on, Put it back on like this. That way you never touch the inside of your mask. If you have to eat and you have a cloth mask, feel free to take it off again using the same technique. Two hands with the ear loops off, never touching the inside. And if you have a cloth mask and you want to reuse it again, just fold this in half. The outside is still exposed to the outside and you've never touched the inside and just put it down. Okay? That is the best way to do it. You never want to touch the inside of that with your dirty hands. When do you not wear a mask? I know this is really silly and I feel really silly for even putting the slide in here, but this woman looks absolutely ridiculous wearing a mask in the middle of the ocean, okay? So I have seen so many people wear masks at inappropriate times that I just thought, okay, I'm gonna have to bring this up just to make sure we are all on the same page here. Why do you wear a mask? I think I've already answered that. So do not wear a mask if you are outside exercising in the air and you're doing an aerobic activity. So aerobic activity is any activity that's going to increase your heart rate, such as running, biking, jogging. And the reason you don't want to do this is because you're, when you put a mask on and you're doing an activity that increases your heart rate, all that CO2 that you breathe out is going to come back into your lung and you can cause what we call CO2 retention or CO2 narcosis. There have been reports of several children dying in Asia during physical activity class with, by doing physical activity and wearing a mask at the same time. So please do not wear that, okay? You obviously don't need a mask if you're by yourself. You're wearing a mask to prevent transmission. If there is no other human being around, you don't need to wear a mask. If you're in the shower, do you really need to wear a mask? <laughs> I, 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 I laughed when I made this up. I know this sounds it's obvious, but it just, some of the people I see walking around with masks at inopportune times, just, it doesn't make any logic sense. If you're eating, obviously don't. And if you're sleeping, you don't need to wear a mask. And like I said, if you're swimming or you're in the middle of the ocean, God forbid, please don't wear a mask. That's, that's just dangerous. Um, face shields. A lot of good material coming out about face shields. Um, this study just came out also on the 29th of April, uh, of April, and it shows basically that if you wear a face shield and if you are able to practice a safe distance, that the face shield is just as effective as a mask. Um, so in this particular study, it's a simulation study, but they basically had the, the healthcare worker within 18 inches of a patient coughing, 
Um, and the healthcare worker is obviously wearing a, a mask and the face shield. The face shield is able to actually in, prevent 96% of that cough from getting into the, the healthcare worker. So if you use a face shield uh, in combination with a mask, it is quite effective at the transmission. If you use the face shield and you practice six feet social distancing, you do not have to wear a mask. Um, but you have to use the face shield with one or the other. You can't just use a face shield alone and be next to someone that's within an inch from you. So I think this is a lot of common sense, but a face shield, needless to say, can be an alternative to those who cannot wear a mask, um, provided you also maintain your six feet distance. So your risk. I think this is a great table at looking at someone and evaluating your own individual risk. Are you a low risk, a medium risk, or high risk? And what kind of occupation do you serve in? Are you in a high risk a category like I am? Or are you in a low risk where you sit at a computer all day? Or are you a medium risk where you have to interact with people such as the grocery workers at the store, the restaurant workers? And I think for, for teachers, I would consider you a, an intermediate or medium risk just because you have contact with children and other adults as well. So for your occupation, I would say you're medium risk and based on that, you have to also look at your own individual health risk and see if you're low, medium, or high and what you have to do. For the most part, if you're A and B and you work in a high risk occupation like I do, you have to wear your PPEs. So for teachers, um, if you're in low risk and you're medium, you still have to wear your PPE that may include a mask or a face shield with the mask or any combination, but it has to be some sort of a physical protective equipment device. So the last slide here will be quick about vaccines. So where are we at with the vaccines? So operational warp speed uh, signed into executive order by President Trump was able to allow drug companies to fast track their vaccine development. Currently, we have three contenders for the vaccine. The, the two, I will say I am most optimistic looking at the data for the University of Oxford and AstraZeneca's vaccine. And I'll tell you why. The reason this is, is because this is the only vaccine that's available now that has been shown to produce T-cell antibodies. The question that we don't know is how long do these T-cell antibodies last? So right now, as of August, they started phase three. So in any clinical trial, you have four phases. Phase four is when it gets released to the public for mass consumption and use. Phase three is when they use it on a very large number of people to try and make sure there are no side effects and to also continuously monitor the drug. All three right now are in phase three of their study. Moderna is another one that's also gotten a lot of press and there's been a lot of interest from the, um, the medical doctors about Moderna as well. That is based out of San Diego, so they're local. Um, so those two right now to me are the top contenders for vaccine. I am optimistic we will have something by the beginning of 2021. It will not be at the end of the year. In order to finish a phase three trial, you have to have at least 30,000 patients. And right now they actually did have 30,000 volunteers. That's a lot of people to go through data safely to make sure that the medication gets released. So I think I'm very hopeful for the beginning of the year to be a vaccine to be available. All right, so my last slide. What did you learn today? I talked through an hour and a half worth of material and hopefully you will leave here understanding what COVID-19 does, how it infects you, how we are treating you and what treatments are available. But just know that this is more infectious than your flu, despite what is being said. Your highest risk patient still remains anyone who's 65 or older with a medical problem. Um, know your risk. I cannot stress that enough. No one knows your medical risk more than you and your doctor. If you have any concerns about your risk factors, you need to talk that over with your primary care physician and determine that risk and whether or not it's appropriate for you to go back to a high risk occupational job. So make sure you evaluate your risk and you use appropriate PPEs. As always, social distance, wear a mask and wash your hands. And that is the end of my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, Mrs. Mark. Would, would you mind helping me get the screen back on? Yes. Sure. <clears throat> so do you feel comfortable sending your boys back to school this time? 
So Mrs. Mora asked me if I felt comfortable sending my two boys back to school. And my answer is absolutely 100%. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I know a lot of teachers here at St. James. I have two boys. One will be entering sixth and one entering the fourth. Since this pandemic hit, I have been working in the hospital setting, taking care of patients um, in the ICU on the medical floor. Why do I go to work? I go to work because I know that if, God forbid, I do get the disease or my children have it, as you can see from my presentation and the stats, the child will end up with very mild disease or no symptoms at all. So I knowingly know that and I volunteer to go to work with a peace of mind that my children will be okay. If I can do that, there is absolutely no reason why I cannot send my children back to school. They need to be back at school. I didn't talk about a lot about the depression. Studies out there published in medical journals to really suggest that children, when they're being locked down, have significant anxiety and depression. It is not good for their psychological and emotional well-being to be at home. So I wholeheartedly support sending my kids back to school. And that is the reason why, if we are lucky enough to get this waiver approved, I am planning to send both my kids back to school. Thank you. Do any of you have any questions for me? Um, I have a question. Yes, Mrs. Lichman. Um, you mentioned physical activity and not wearing masks. What does that mean for our students during PE and P and uh, recess? So if they are doing any type of physical activity and they are in PE, I do not recommend wearing a mask. Instead, uh, I would recommend doing more of a social distancing type of activity. So right now we are, I have Brody in soccer and we are practicing soccer. We're doing tennis and everyone is maintaining distancing. So they don't get in each other's face. They practice kick, kickballs uh, safely from a distance. There are ways to still keep our kids healthy by doing sports, but not, and also maintain our distance and appropriately. So for PE in particular, I do not recommend wearing masks. For outside recess, they are outside. If they are running, um, if they are participating in, in whatever, you know, sports, they also do not need to wear a mask. If you have a question, please take yourself off mute and ask me. Um, I just had a quick question, Dr. Bowie. Um, my husband is uh, an asthmatic, and I was wondering in terms of, um, we've been incredibly cautious about where we go and, you know, all of the above, but, um, when I am here, what can I do before I come home to help prevent, you know, the transmission to him further? Of course, I'll be washing my hands. I mean, I've heard as far as going in the garage and changing before you go in the home, is all of that necessary? I mean, you know, it's not like I'm, you know, licking my clothes or doing anything like that before I go in the house. So is that something that I could do to help him to protect him even further? Um, I know I don't, I don't think you need to do that. Um, so I'll say, I'll share with you my story. So I go to work every day and what we do is we actually change out of our regular clothes and we wear scrubs. So, we, and then when we go home, we then put our regular clothes back on. I always wear the same shoes to work every day and they're sitting out in my garage. I don't drag them in. At the end of my day, I'll just go take a shower because I'm sweaty, I'm dirty. I've been in, in the hospital all day long just because I need one. It's not because I'm doing it because I'm going to scrub this virus down from my skin, okay? And if you remember, it's still a respiratory a virus. So the most important thing you can do is to prevent yourself from getting the virus so that you don't give it to your husband. And by that, you can wear a mask with a face shield to protect yourself from getting the virus. And you practice hand distancing. If you feel like you need to take a shower just to make sure you're fully clean when you come home, that is perfectly acceptable, but we don't need to be scrubbing down our clothes and taking extra measures. Um, because again, this virus, as I said, it lives on surfaces, but it hasn't been shown to live in our clothes. And if you just put your clothes in the washer and wash it like you always do in the same spot all the time, you're not gonna get this virus from your clothes. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Jen. Um, so going to the grocery store, buying groceries, when we bring those groceries home, should we, should we be using pull box wipes or, or something to wipe the groceries down? So James asked, when you go to the grocery store and you get those plastic bags, do you need to wipe down those bags uh, before you take it home? My answer simply is no. Um, if you just look at the slide I had, the plastic, it actually does stay in the plastic for a while. But if you're concerned you're dragging it into your countertop, don't take the grocery store and leave it on your countertops. I usually take the grocery store bag and I leave it on the floor. And then I you know, pretty much unload my grocery and I dispose the grocery bags. I wipe the floor down you know, weekly just to make sure. But if, if you're that conscious, then you should, that's something to consider. But if you want to put the grocery bag on the, on the countertops and then wipe the countertops afterwards, you can do that. But you don't need to wipe the Clorox bleach with the plastic bags. Any other questions? Yeah, I had a question about um, the surgical mask. So I know a lot of people either have the surgical mask or the cotton mask. Um, 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 do you recommend, recommend wearing, like, wearing a surgical mask and then say like a bandana or a, a little neck, what is it, the gator over to keep the outside clean and then washing the cotton mask or? So you're asking if you can wear more than one mask? I'm asking, uh, would you recommend wearing this, keeping the outside of the surgical mask clean with a reusable mask so that for people who don't have, you know, one surgical mask per day? You can. There's, there's a lot of things you can do. You can wear a surgical, ma surgical mask underneath the cloth mask. You can wear the mm -hmm. surgical mask over the cloth mask. Um, there's multiple things you can do. And certainly the more layers you have, the more protection you have. Um, personally speaking, when I go to work, I don't just wear the N95, I actually wear two. I wear the surgical mask over my N95 in addition to the face shield that I have, mm -hmm. as well as my scrubs and the caps and the booty. So um, the more layers you have, so it prevent transmission of the virus, whether you're breathing it out or taking it in the back. Okay. Yes. I have a question. Yes. In regards to uh, the classroom and supplies, passing out papers, um, putting so touching supplies in the class, would that be limited to the teacher and the student? Could students pass papers out to other students? Like, what's that surface contagion? I mean, what would we have to do or not do? I'm not sure that that is really going to make any difference in terms of transmission um, because, again, it's on cardboard. So it's 24 hours if you actually have someone who sneezes or cough on, on something. Um, there's nothing in on paper as far as the virus staying on surface as far as paper is concerned, if you're worried about that. Um, mostly if, if you just want to have maybe limit one person to passing out the paper to limit the amount of people actually touching it, Mm -hmm. um, that would be fine. I think anything that you can do to limit the amount of exposure or other people touching things, surfaces, yeah. that would be the better. Thank you. Any other questions? Anyone else? Okay, I think we're done, Mrs. Morrow. Oh, this is wonderful. Oh, faculty, let's give her a big round of applause. Isn't that wonderful? You all didn't fall asleep. Lots That's of great. wonderful information. <laughs> Stay online, guys, because we have Mrs. Nunez uh, from Waxy, Adrian's mom, who is here to tell you a little bit about uh, the plan for sanitizing in your classrooms and such. Okay, so I just want to talk a little bit about um, just what, what's going to be going on in the classrooms um, and then answer any questions that you guys might have about the products that we've chosen for you to use. Um, I have a little guide here um, that we use for all of our um, businesses, whether that be education, government, hospitality, food service. 
Um, but I'm not going to go too much in detail because I think um, Dr. Bowie did a fabulous job there. So I'm not going to go into the um, actual details of coronavirus because I think she covered that. But I just want to get into, um, bear with me here. So we just talk about, um, you know, what to do to keep yourself safe. Um, hand hygiene is a big part of that. Obviously, I think she did a great job covering that. So I just want to get into the disinfectant portion here. So when um, when we look at a disinfectant, um, basically, you know, the, the topic of the day, obviously, is COVID-19. Um, disinfectants are effective against lots of different microbes, bacteria, fungus, other viruses. Um, but obviously right now, the, the big one in question is COVID-19. So in order to evaluate a disinfectant on is it effective or not, the um, methodology that we use right now is a list that the EPA put out and it's called the end list. And most people, you know, before this pandemic probably didn't even know that lists like that existed. It's actually not the first of its kind. Um, but now we're pretty well versed in that term. Um, if you're not, um, you can access the list by going to uh, the EPA's website, which is epa.gov, and you can just, or you can just even Google endless. It will be the first thing that pops up. And that's just a quick way. Um, if you would like to um, know whether or not a disinfectant that you're using, whether that be um, you know in your home or or what have you, um, is on that list. So all you need to do to be able to, um, I'm just not smart enough to show you guys, but um, what you do is just go to the, the end list and then they have a way to search by an EPA number. And the EPA number um, is on the label or bottle of every disinfectant um, in the world. Uh, that's how they regulate those products. And so um, in order to be a disinfectant, the product has to be registered with the EPA. And the reason for that is that disinfectants are in fact pesticides. Um, so that sounds kind of scary because you know we all know that those can have some negative consequences. But the reason that they're pesticides is because they are killing living things, microbes. So um, that's how the EPA you know, kind of controls and rates things to be able to keep us safe. So every product will have that number, but then not all products will be on that end list, which um, any, any product on that list has been evaluated for being effective against killing uh, human coronavirus, COVID-19. So um, what you do is you just take that EPA number and it's usually broken up into three segments separated by dashes. You only need the first two sections. So it'll be like, I think it's five digits, dash two digits, something like that. And they just want the, that portion. It'll tell you on the website as well. And then once you enter that number, it'll come up with the product, um, its uh, common name, what its full registration number is, and then it'll tell you the contact time. And that is specific to COVID-19. Different microorganisms, when they're being killed by a disinfectant, have different kill times. So I'm gonna go into a little bit about what that means. So kill time is also known as contact time. It's also referred to as dwell time. What this all means is basically the amount of time that that chemical needs to do its job, which is to kill that particular microorganism. So for example, the product that we're gonna be using in the classrooms, and I'll, I'll show you in more detail in just a moment, is um, a product by 3M. And this particular product has a COVID-19 kill time of three minutes. So what does that mean? That means that any surface that it is either wiped on or sprayed on must remain wet for three minutes. Does that mean drips coming off the side of the desk? Does that mean completely like, you know, a puddle? Um, no, absolutely not. Just damp, visible. Um, if you were to wipe your finger on it, it, you know, you would have some kind of residue on your finger um, for three minutes. And that is so that we can ensure that that chemistry had time to actually do its job. And um, this is this is a big topic. It might seem very common sense, um, but surprisingly, it's not. And, and it's OK. You know, most of us shouldn't have to have a degree in infection control to be able to just live our daily lives. But um, something that I've noticed and um, I, I try to share with people as often as I can is, you know, there's a lot of misuse going on. There's a lot of misinformation. 
um, we're starting to find that there's actually over disinfection going on and um, that's going to be you know a concern later on so that was also something that we took into consideration in choosing the product that we chose for the school um, is that we don't want something that's going to be super toxic we needed something that was going to be fairly quick acting because obviously you don't have a lot of time you, you know you guys are trying to teach the children and and be with them you know we don't want you spending you know 30 minutes of your day cleaning the classroom that being said um you know there has to be that balance of effectiveness versus toxicity um and usefulness so we've noticed that is it okay if it went to like a screen like a i just want to make sure i didn't lose anything sorry sorry guys that's okay 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 i'm sorry so um so you know a perfect example this is an example i use a lot um but you know when you go to the grocery store and now you know they have the wonderful people that are waiting outside and they're you know um, saying that they're sanitizing all the carts before we use them really and truly um if we want to be you know technical and um you know accurate in, in doing our disinfection they're they're actually not correctly cleaning those carts and, and this is what i mean so usually when you see them um they have some kind of spray bottle or maybe like a mister machine and they spray the handle of the cart and then they take you know whatever wiper or paper towel whatever that they have and then they wipe it off that just did nothing maybe mechanically they removed some of those pathogens that were on that cart with the the mechanical action of the you know paper towel or wipe and that's you know now living on that uh cloth or paper but that chemistry didn't have but a couple seconds to do its job and then it was wiped away. So essentially that is, you know, you might hear the term that's going around right now, it's becoming a lot more popular, hygiene theater. That's absolutely an example of hygiene theater. And what that term means is just the look of being clean without actually being clean. So um, another uh, term uh, kind of misnomer that's out there is the difference between sanitizing and disinfecting. So the difference between the two is actually sanitizing kills bacteria. So sanitizing, that term is used a lot in food service, um, what have you, because food service, they actually cannot use disinfectants because it's too harsh for where food's gonna be prepared. Um, you can, but it has to be rinsed away later. So um, when, when what we're gonna actually be doing is disinfecting, and disinfecting is strong enough to kill viruses because again, that's what we're worried about. Now, that being said, um, you know, there will come a time, hopefully, that COVID-19 isn't the only thing that we're concerned about anymore. There will come a time again, as you know, all you teachers know all too well, flu season, um, you know, sniffles, all these other things. There's other um, microorganisms that we'd be worried about out there. And this particular disinfectant is effective against a wide range of those uh, pathogens. So that's what we love too. Again, topic of the day, 1000% COVID-19, but, it for you know long term it's going to also be effective against a lot of other things um this product is bactericidal fungicidal viricidal and um it's hospital grade which which we love so um let me see here so again um you know we just talk about in this guide and i'll make sure that you guys can all have access to this if you need it um, you know, how to choose a disinfectant. Um, we've already kind of gone through, um, you know, how we went about that. Um, this kind of just gives you an example of what a standard label will look like. And you can see there circled in red is where you find the EPA registration number. And again, any product should or will have that. Um, the next thing I just want to quickly touch on is kind of what we're going to be focusing on. Again, with this kind of overuse, misuse of disinfectant, um, you know, I've seen pictures of people outside, you know, spraying sidewalks. And, and again, it's, it's, you know, everybody's, their heart's in the right place. You know, we caught, this caught everybody kind of off guard. No, nobody knows what to do. Everybody thinks maybe you can't ever disinfect too much, but um, there is a fine line. So really what we need to focus on when we're disinfecting is high touch points. So basically what people are going to be coming in contact with. Not disinfecting the floor, uh, except for in areas where children are coming in contact with the floor, younger kids, you know, maybe that are, are spending time, you know, circle time on the floor, what have you. But for the most part, floors are not disinfected for obvious reasons because they're immediately um, contaminated again with our shoes. Um, so this is just a kind of a list of uh, what we recommend that people focus on, not only to, you know, save the, themselves the labor and 
and, you know, it not serving a purpose, but also to be able to, you know, be efficient with our disinfectants, not kind of, you know, we're not coming in and just fogging a room because that's not going to be helpful, safe, or effective for anybody. So this is just a nice list of, you know, again, it's common sense, um, the things that the kids are touching, the door handles, the light switches, faucets, um, things in the restroom, uh, obviously the desk surfaces, counter surfaces, um, you know, keyboards, those kind of things. So um, we'll go into, I think that's actually, I'll, I wanna talk about the product itself and then I'll talk about how we use it and then we can open it up for any questions that you guys probably have. Do I just Other click video. over, please? You're awesome. Thank you. Okay, good. So this is the um, the disinfect, and I apologize. I would have put this in like a slide format, um, but I kind of came here last minute today. So um, this is kind of just the info sheet on the product. Um, it, it's its name is 40A uh, three. I'm just names there. So uh, letters doesn't have like a cute name or anything. Um, but it's 40A. Uh, it's we we liked it for a couple reasons. Um, 3M is obviously a very well-known name. I mean, we pretty much all of us use some kind of product from them in our daily lives, whether it's post-it notes or cleaners or tape, what have you, they're just, they're everywhere. So we like that they're well-known, reputable, um, they're, they make amazing products. And um, this is something that a lot of other school districts are currently using. Obviously many hospitals use this. Um, so we like that aspect. Um, we like that it's fragrance free, it's dye free. Um, it doesn't require any kind of mask or goggles or anything to be worn while it's being sprayed, which is nice because that just wouldn't make sense for you guys in, in the environment that we're using it for. Um, and then again, with that three minute time, we're not having to sit and wait, you know, when we just have a quick couple minutes in between recess or whatever that's gonna look like in your particular classroom. Um, so again, this just kind of calls out, um, the different, uh, there, there's a longer list, but this kind of just highlights some of the uh, pathogens that it's rated to kill. Um, and it, it's good for all the surfaces that we're going to be coming in contact with in the classroom. So that's great. Um, what you're going to be provided is a spray bottle. It will be labeled with the appropriate label that is required. And um, you'll literally just have to spray and just let it sit. You can go back and wipe if you choose to. However, that's not necessary. Um, you can pre-clean first. Again, that probably won't be necessary. This is literally just intended to be throughout the day as you feel necessary or have a break in between, you know, students being in the classroom, what have you, um, to be able to just decontaminate those surfaces that they're coming in contact with, just to kind of keep that viral load low throughout the day. And then of course, you know, that deep cleaning is going to be happening at night. Um, so let's see, what else can I tell you here? Um, they just spray it on and leave Exactly. Yeah. And, and it doesn't have to, we're not looking for, you know, a stream, um, just kind of misting is enough. And, and then after that time, I mean, it definitely, you know, it's, it's a very safe product. That being said, we really want to try to avoid do, doing the spraying when the students are actually physically in class. Um, it's not going to be something that if, you know, it comes in contact accidentally in somebody's skin, they don't have to call poison control or anything. Obviously, it's a disinfectant. So like with anything like that, you know, definitely it would be poison control if somebody accidentally drank it. But aside from that, um, it, it's not going to harm anybody. Definitely, if you got it on your hands or something, you probably want to wash them anyway. But it's not going to be, you know, burning you or hurting anybody. Again, that's part of why we chose it. Um, so, yeah, really, we just want to focus on probably the desk surfaces. Um, again, the, the keyboards, um, the shelves, yeah, so maybe the door handles, the handrails, um, you know, maybe if, you, if you're in the younger grades, uh, if there's manipulatives that they're using. Um, it's just really meant to be 
simple, um, a tool for you, not a burden, definitely not like an extra, you know, chore. You don't have to be going around. <laughs> um, it, it's just, sorry. Thank no you. wiping necessary. No, absolutely not. No, Miss Moore was saying wiping necessary. No, um, you absolutely can. Like say if you just feel like, oh, it's been three minutes. It's still a little wetter than I'd like it to be. And the kids are about to come back and put their papers there. You could take a paper towel and just quickly wipe it away. Any, you could do anything you want after that three minutes has passed. Yeah, I think that's kind of it in a nutshell. I hope I didn't go through it too fast, but um, what questions can I answer? I unmuted it. Did you unmute it? Yeah. I have a question. Yes, please. Wait. Yeah, you're there. Um, I wanted to know if we're like using computers in the classroom and the kids are still in there, am I able to wipe down the mouse and the keyboard and let it dry? Or I mean spray, not wipe. Absolutely. You could do either. Like if, if that's the case, like say you say that somebody wanted to clean, you know, the, the computer that's right in front of you right here. But here. Uh, for that situation, I would recommend spraying the product onto a wipe or a paper towel and then just wiping it. That way you're just not spraying it right in their face. Um, again, there's nothing really showing that it, it would hurt, but it's just generally not a good idea for anybody to ever breathe any kind of chemical. Yeah. That makes sense. So yeah, if you had to do something like that situation where there was a child right there or, you know, it's still in the room, then I would recommend just kind of giving your paper towel a couple squirts and then just wiping it that way. Okay, perfect. That that answers because I know some of our classrooms have computers in the back that we may or may not be using. I don't know what that's going to look like this year, but I wanted to find out about that. Okay. Well, okay, and my other question is, what about their own devices? So, like, if they have their own Chromebooks or iPads, are they able to... I guess the teachers have to do it, or can the kids wipe it down themselves? What's your feedback on that? What I would recommend in that case, um, again, I know that the more like uh, regulatory we sound about it, then it's gonna make it seem like, well, this, this doesn't really sound as safe as you're saying. But that being said, um, I probably wouldn't want the kids to handle the spray bottle. Um, yeah. So I don't know if if that could look like maybe you spray their paper towel for them and or have like one person designated to be spraying the paper towels and passing them out that way. Um, or maybe for that regard. Exactly. Maybe for that regard, we just ha get you guys a Clorox wipe that that way you could just pass out one Clorox wipe. Okay. That's, but that's, that's good. Because, and that, this is why I wanted these questions because I know you know your classroom environment. I, I don't. So you're going to think of these yeah. scenarios that, um, you know, okay. we're not thinking of. We have to spray the towel first, then the white device. Okay. Anything else you, you girls want to ask? Mm -hmm. nope. Right. So we don't spray the device directly. No. We spray it on the towel yeah. Yeah. It. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. And then so when the middle school comes back on campus, the teachers are Yeah, Mrs. Morrow was just asking for middle school in between classes. Um, you know, yeah, it's literally just that as long as that three minutes has gone by, then, you know, you can come in contact with it. You can wipe it off if you need to. It, whatever needs to happen after that point can happen. I have to. Any other questions? Any other questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, are we just going to spray the surface? We don't wipe it at all. We just like spray it and then just let it go for three minutes. Is that right? Exactly. It can just dry on its own. You okay. have the option if you need to, want to, just feel like it, wiping it after. Just, right. But you can absolutely just let it air dry. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Any other questions, guys? I have a question. Hey, yeah. I have a question. Oh. Go ahead. Is it my turn or Shelby? 
Yeah, I have a question. So um, I work here in the library. Mm -hmm. So what do you recommend about books? If a, if a book was returned to me, what do you recommend? Would you uh, uh, rather uh, have me spray, use a spray to clean the surface of the books or use wipes? Which one is more effective? They're both going to be, oops, gosh, so sorry, I know the microphone here. Um, they're both going to be equally effective. It's just going to really be a matter of if you're, if you were spraying directly on the book, then right. come down to the, the coarseness of the spray, how the, you know, how the spray bottle is set, if it's set more on a mist versus a coarse spray. Okay. Um, in that regard, I would probably recommend with your books, you probably don't spray directly on them. I just think over Correct. time, and that would be if anything, even if you're just spraying them with water, I think over time, they just might become overly saturated. So Correct. maybe either wipes, um, you know, we can provide you with some Clorox wipes for that application, or just, you know, spray your paper towel and then use that to wipe okay. the book. Okay. Thank I you. hope that, that answers it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Was there another question? Question? Yes, please. Can you hear me? Yep, hear um, so the kids are bringing in certain supplies, one of them being Clorox wipes and, um, um, you know, like baby wipes. How mm -hmm. do we incorporate that? Should we not? Have them bring, you know, bring them in or, um, yeah, have, we'll we'll be incorporate have them. Them. yeah, you can have them bring them. Basically what, what this product is, is being, um, you know, that the main purpose behind it was something that could be quick for you. So imagine if you had the option to either go around with the spray sprayer or go around with a Clorox wipe, like the amount of time that it would take to use the wipe versus the spray. So that was our thinking. Now, with that being said, I think we've already identified a couple scenarios where a wipe would be more useful in this case. So absolutely, because the Clorox wipes are going to have about that same dwell time as the spray that you're going to be using. It's about two to three minutes on Clorox wipes. So, okay, so um, not using one or the other is going to be more effective? I mean, like if well, we use Clorox wipes, okay. Yeah, they're both going to be equally the same. Like I said, they're right in that range, um, okay. you know, same range. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Mrs. Ingram, did you have a question? No, you didn't. Did we answer it? Say hi to Adrian for us. Oh, <laughs> you're so sweet. <laughs> thank you. I will. He's he's uh, missing school. Anybody else? You guys are awesome. Yes. Smarties. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Nunez. Absolutely. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. All right. See you later.